Now, he made one thing that completely shifted my opinion towards folding. He made this gesture where he took his cards. Let's crush. So it's 7 a.m. Vegas time. Jet lag is not that hard. Time to get a workout, breakfast, do some groceries, and then we're gonna be heading to the casino. Tech team is today. I'm gonna be playing with Jeremy. <laughs> I hope we're not gonna be dunking at all. This guy is trying to learn some poker. <laughs> you think you're gonna have an edge today? You're gonna have an edge today? Easy, easy. <laughs> And then we go slender some dogs. <laughs> All right, we're going to Whole Foods. Meat, coconut water, fruits, and that's it. Just the occasional $43 honey. We're gonna try it, let's see. So groceries is done. $40 Manuka honey. honey. Manuka honey. Oh wow, it's creamy as fuck. But if it's worth forty dollars, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you want to try? Yeah, I'll have some. You want to try from the same spoon? Doesn't bother you me. Mind? Let me just uh, put my mask back. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, sauerkraut, Deutsches sauerkraut. If you see me, come by. Grab yourself a, a razor edge badge. What's the best way? To prepare while you're in the camp, going over some spots. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, come on. We're not I'm playing tag team with you. We're not you're going to punting it off. We're not going to fold that. Ah, oh, Jesus. You have to fold in these no. live don't come in. We're not folding that. So, we're just starting tag team. I think we've got a pretty good table. Jay is waiting somewhere. I don't know where. But we go with the first over. So you want to sign me those, yeah? You can, you can sign Rex and Phil Ivy. Uh, You're what's the, the online best, goat. What's the best spot here? A lot of people have been asking me, Ben, isn't this a pretty um, marginal reshare with pocket aids? Yes, under certain circumstances it is. But as you know, with live poker, your decisions really depend on the players you're playing against. Typically, I would flat call because reshoving pocket aids against under the gun and also under the gun and hijack were playing, I think, 50, 60, 70 big blinds against each other effectively. So I would expect that hijack also calls a lot of hands. Um, that will also call my all in even if under the gun folds. So the hijack is not really dead money. Now, in live tournaments, people also play a bit looser. Under the gun was a pretty decent player uh, who understood that this is a pretty good table. So he would open a lot of hands, trying to play a lot of pots against certain opponents on this table. So he would open wider than I would say the average regular from what I've seen. And hijack was a recreational player so I would expect him to have flat call at all hands. He's not supposed to flat, you know, like Jack-8 suited, 7-9 suited, most of the suited aces, if not all of them, uh, suited king x hand. So we have lots of forward equity there. Uh, we can still run into a big hand behind us, but then it is what it is. If under the gun would be a tight player and he's not having those auto forwards in his range, like ace-10 off, queen-9 suited, Jack-8 suited, then I would certainly uh, prefer to call, but if I have the read, alright, this guy plays pretty loose, he plays pretty aggressive, he's likely open raising uh, loser than most players, then pocket eight at least becomes against him a much better reshuffle. Hijack, again, yes, he will have tens and jacks occasionally, or nines, or ace queen, maybe even ace king, can happen, but I decided that uh, still reshuffle because he still also has all the other crap hands, as I just mentioned. Small blind. <laughs> 
then goes into the tank. But he was also the whale well on the table, what we would say in the poker language. Uh, he ended up taking all my chips because I made a pretty <laughs> questionable hero call, let's put it this way, with ASI against him. So yeah, he ended up taking all my chips, so maybe I'm the whale, but whatever. So he tanks, he calls, under the gun folds, hijack tanks and also ends up calling. And then the board runs out 10, 9, 7, uh, or 9, 7, sorry, 9, 7, 10, uh, 5 deuce, something like that. And small blind tables, king jack off, and hijack, ace 4 suited. So live games are crazy as fuck. Oh, I think he had king jack suited, at uh, least to his defense. Um, so, but I think it might even be king jack off. Apparently, he really liked the hand. And when I jammed, he seemed really pissed because he really wanted to see a flop. Maybe because he posted the small blind, so he felt committed to the pot. But we hold. We triple up from like 7k to 22-ish. And yeah, con continued playing with uh, 17 big blinds, uh, 70 big blinds. This is how I, make, how I distinguish between when do I want to call, when do I want to be, re when do I want to reshuffle, when ranges are just way too loose. Reshuffling just becomes so insanely profitable because you also you play multi way very likely someone over calls you're going to be playing four way and if you don't hit your set you can ah, almost never continue unless you you hit an over pair but even if it's ten five dues and under the gun bets or middle position bets and you have two players behind you're always going to be in the sandwich position that is very difficult to play and then it's really hard to realize that we it's really hard to realize that equity so that's why. And in a lot of these situations, you just take the regen uh, unless you know that okay, and the ranges are pretty tight, pretty solid, then the call might become a little bit better. All right, that was pretty much the biggest pot and the most interesting hand of the day in the tag team event with Tim Thompson under the gun table spot. Biggest stack, you know that situation when there's some guy who's just splashing around but he's winning all pots, flopping nuts left and right. I had a lot of very accurate reads. Also Jeremy, of course, when you in a tag team event, the moment he jumps in, I send him a message with all my notes, all my reads on these opponents. He does the same. And we had very similar reads on, these op on this opponent and like, a lot of very good showdowns on how he plays it. I wish later on the river share the reads because it becomes very important uh, for my decision making. Now. He limps under the gun. We play 501k, 1k big blind anti. We have 40-ish, 40k. He limps under the gun, which he did a lot. He did it earlier, 6-2 suited, calling raises. So like he can have 6-2 suited, 6-3 suited, 7-4 four, four, four suited, 10-6 suited, all, all that kind of hands. Yeah. He was still raising a lot and 3-betting and fast playing his strong hands. So. It also becomes important later on. Anyway, it falls to me on the button. I raise three X. Could have even gone bigger, four or five big blinds with ace 10 off. Blinds forward, he calls. We go heads up to the flop. The flop comes king, queen, nine. Uh, I don't have any relevant suits. It, there's a flush draw. So I decided to check because on this board, um, I expect him to raise kings, queens, nines. I was very certain he raised those because he has been playing mixed, raise and limp. Not, of course, a balanced GGO strategy. Um, and on the shot on, he typically showed ace king, he showed ace queen, he showed all these kind of hands, but in his limp pots, he typically mostly showed this low hand. So I thought that it doesn't really make sense to bet a lot against the range where he has like six deuces. If he has a flush three continues anyway, he might raise and then get puts, push, pushes me off my equity. He played quite wild post flop as well, quite splashy. And so I decided to check back against that range. I think that's the best play. Betting is not a terrible mistake, but just like he can still be on king three suited or queen five suited, and you know it's not the kind of player that I really want to start barreling a lot. I would only do that with very high equity draws, and so I check it back. Turn is an eight, brings the backdoor flush draw. So we have the flop flush draw uh, with in hearts and the backdoor flush draw in clubs. He bets 5k into, yeah, around 6k, 6.5k with blinds. Uh, five, let's say 5k into 6.5k. Uh, I decided to call because he has all these 6-7 suited flush draws, 10-7 suited right. And also, very important, he's very afraid of thin value betting. He did two or three times some insane checks on the river and you could see he's afraid of better hands. He's checked nut flush draw, nut flushes on paired boards where you have the easiest value bet. He checked two pair on ASI boards. Um, he liked either to play very trappy and tricky or he's just 
our impression with Jeremy was he's he's afraid of thin value betting, uh, especially when the board is scary. So the turn is an eight, and uh, we do very well against this range. So I think the turn, yeah, is a good call with having an overcard, gut shot, and just being ahead very often, and just with one more card to come. It's always more difficult when you have these kind of hands um, when you're on the flop because you're further away from the from the showdown. He has one more opportunity to bluff. The pots can get quite a lot more expensive. We call, and then so there's around 60, 70 k in the middle on the river, and he bets 17 k. So he basically bets pot, and the river is a blank four. Right? There's so many rivers where we can give it up, and I already thought on the turn, well, we might have to hero call on some rivers. And you might wonder, why wow, is this not marginal? Like, against this specific opponent, there are two factors. One, the strategy approach against him. Sometimes, especially live, and I do the same online, I have a good idea of someone plays, and I can put him on a pretty good range, and I know that, hey, my, I have like 50% equity, and I need... 30%, it's just a massively profitable call. No matter how soft the field is, it's just a call. It's like aces, yeah, it's like massively profitable. In this spot, I feel pretty good. I was like, I didn't mind seeing him betting pot. I would have hated him betting half pot, knowing that he probably does not, yeah, and just has a hand where he wants to milk me, right? Um, so he bets pot, and again, he's not having all these like king, queens, queens, kings, nines, eights. It's also probably questionable that whether he bets a king, um, I felt very, very certain that he's not value betting a one pair hand, like a king jack, king 10, king seven or whatever, especially with that size. Um, he did not do this with his strong hands at all, but he liked to go for like really random bluffs. He played a hand against JLJ, told me he just went completely out of line sometimes with like even hands you're not supposed to bluff. And now on this board, considering his preflop range when he limp calls, like six two, he limp called earlier six two suited in a similar spot from under the gun against an ISO race. So you can imagine he's six two suited, six three suited, ten seven suited, ten six suited, um, busted flush draws, and then these are reasonable hands he could be bluffing with, and then he can just have completely complete brain farts. So I thought that's a pretty easy call actually, right? It looks punty with ace ten, but the jack ten suited is I think then this kind of hand category where he might switch into limping, right? Uh, jack 10, 10, 9, 10, 8, 10, 7, 6, 4 suited, these kind of hands. We block Jack 10. I don't really want to talk too much about blockers in life games. I think it's pretty dumb, but you know, sometimes it's necessary. So I was feel very comfortable on the, uh, on the court. Now, he made one thing that completely shifted my opinion towards folding. He made this gesture where he took his cards, so he had his cards here, and then I was thinking for a minute or two, and then he took his cards as if he wants to muck them. Like he took his cards literally like this, like right before when you want to throw them in the muck, right? He took, he takes the cards like this and I was like, the fuck he has it. He just has it. And I was like, Ben, just throw your, throw everything overboard. He just showed you, he has it. But I was like, ah, I haven't played live in like three years, right? I played the WCP in 2014 and 2018. I played the EPT Barcelona. So I had like three, three series, but I haven't been playing live in three years. So I was like, I don't want to put too much weight on my reads yet. I want to get a little bit into it, play a few tournaments, get a bit of a groove, get a, get a bit of experience. I had some actually pretty good um, tales on some people. But in this big pot, I was like, just in terms of the range breakdown, I was so sure it's just such a good call against him. Um, but this tell, he basically, he basically told me he has it. Um, and in hindsight, I'm like, all right. Fuck it. I called, he had Jack 10 off, um, and I, <laughs> yeah, I think if this would have happened like midway through the, the trip, I would have probably fought it because I got a bit more experience. I got, I got more confirmation that some of my reads might be right, some of my tags that I have on opponents might be right, and then you start trusting it. But of course, if you're mainly an online player, you trust a bit more your, the strategic approach to the game. And um, yeah, but honestly, I think in hindsight, the call that basically cost me my tournament life, I was down to 10 big blinds after that, and then I just, yeah, I doubled up once. I blinded down to five big blinds, and jammed with Queen Jack off into Ace-9, and I was out. But anyway, um, I also told Jer that in those situations, I would have probably hated myself more after I would have fought it, and I was like, ah, I hate this read, I fought it, but I was like, man, but like, he played so splashy. 
I would have twisted it around and hated myself for folding because I had all these reads on this opponent, the way he played leading up to that. And I was like, I should have probably not emphasized so much on that one tell. It is what it is. So I made the call, I was wrong. And yeah, basically cost me the tournament life. It was a fun tournament though. And uh, the next one is gonna be the Millionaire Mag Maker. And we're also gonna be making a vlog for that. So I see you guys there. And don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. Let me know in the comments, what would you like to see? What kind of format, especially for vlogging? We're gonna be pumping out more vlogs from the WCP. Thank you guys for tuning in and I see you soon.